Hello, how are you? Um, I'm here today to talk about homeschooling um, in the African American community. Um, we tried to do it last Sunday, but we weren't able to do it. Um, and today is a challenge too, because I still have my granddaughter and um, Um, but we're going to talk with Malika Diggs today um, and talk about her experience as a homeschool um, and the reason why I invited Ms. Diggs to this conversation is because I'm doing the research on homeschooling in the African American community and she had a lot of experience so I like to learn from other people's experience. Um, she started Electric Learning Networks, uh, which is a networking of homeschoolers. Um, so hi, Malik. I see you on camera here. Hello. Hello, Hello you... sideways. Yeah. Uh, Your camera I may have to sideways. adjust it. Yeah. Give me a second. All right. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Um, no problem. Have... Give me a second. Okay. Yeah. So, how are you today? I'm pretty good. How about yourself? Good. Can't complain. Always busy. Always yes. busy. And please um, excuse, I do have my granddaughter here. I was supposed to take her home earlier, but that didn't happen. So, no um, problem. Of course. Her, yeah, okay. And she's fighting her sleep right now, but hopefully she'll be asleep Aww. soon. Won't, no problem. Won't bother. Hello. Okay. <laughs> thanks. Um, so thanks for joining me today. Um, because yeah. I'm really looking into what does um homeschooling looks like in the African American communities and what our options are um with the different platforms that offer schooling at home from public school in your home to actual building curriculums around what you want um your children to learn. So mm -hmm. um, when I read over your bio, um, you had said that you started out homeschooling because you were frustrated with the public school system, um, but then you started with the K-12 platform. So mm -hmm. could you start with why you started homeschooling first and then a little bit about the um, K-12 platform? Sure. Um, I was definitely in the very beginning. I was I was pro school. Um, I was completely pro school, and um, I figure I was a product of the Philadelphia school system. So you know why not? I mean, I knew it definitely had its issues, but I felt like I could. That was something that I could supplement at home and not be concerned at all. And when I went to enroll my daughter into public school, um, there was there was an instant issue because the principal did not believe that we were residents of that neighborhood. She just could not believe that we lived in this particular neighborhood. And um, that was probably the first time that my children really saw me in a different light because I knew right there that we're, this was a problem. And if this woman is gonna be the leader of this institution with a woman who is non-Black and a woman who is really out there being the leader for a school that probably is now about 86% children of color. Um, and you're not believing me and you're asking for proof of residence just because I don't look like I'm a person who would live in this particular neighborhood. So that was, it was, I would say that was my final straw because I was definitely on the fence to begin with. Um, but I really just didn't know how and it was scary. Um, but when I saw the K-12 program, I thought, wow, this could be a really great transition. It was really relieving to me to know that they supplied curriculums and, you know, there was free resources, a free computer, free, you know, all those things that in the very beginning of this journey would be a great relief to a person like myself who was not willing to put my daughters through public school, but at the same time, or brick and mortar school, but at the same time, I wanted to supply them with what I believed 
was an education. And we went through that process. And as appreciative as I was with the process, um, the support that I did receive, I learned very quickly that it really wasn't that different than sending my child to a brick and mortar school for me. Um, it was still test driven. It was still rooted in Eurocentric ideas. Um, it was completely and utterly still a mark of conditioning that I had already went through that I was really working hard to not put my daughters through. So in that moment, I realized that I had in that moment became an extension of a system that I was so desperately trying to get away from. So, and we officially went homeschooling maybe about a year or so after um, with no curriculum, um, or I would say just workbooks. And then we went through a series of different methods and styles. And currently, we function as an unschooling. So my daughters do not have a curriculum that they follow. They really get into what they want to get into on their own terms. And they ask me for what they need. And I support it with whatever resources I'm able to get for them at the time. Okay, so um, the K through 12 experience, it didn't, it wasn't personalized for you. You can create um, like history lessons that you wanted to incorporate and then they would accept um, that or was it? I just um, felt like it was very much. Like, mm -hmm. Go ahead. Um, because I just want to know because um, even with the brick and mortar schools, when I want to take my children out to do other lessons, I can do that and it's still counted as an educational activity. So I was mm -hmm. just wondering if that was ever offered to you as a K through 12 parent. Yeah, I didn't even, honestly, I didn't get, I wasn't even interested in, in that. My, my issues initially kicked off with this idea of mastery and this idea that there's, there, there's still this idea of teaching to the test. And I'm not for that. Um, there's still an area of attendance that's required. So if you, depending on which one you sign up for, the one that I went through, they separated children based on asynchronous learning and synchronous learning, which basically just supposedly means advanced versus standard. Um, and I have a problem with all of those terms uh, for me personally, because if I'm dealing with a child who learns differently, they may categorize them as having a learning difference when in truth, it's just learning differently. So where is the space and time for that? Uh, so for me, um, one, there's no introduction of any type of alternate history that was given. I mean, when we got to Columbus, I just made it really crystal clear that that was not something we were going to do and they could do whatever they felt was necessary. Um, I didn't care about getting an F or failing or anything of that nature because the idea of even showcasing Columbus to me is a failure. So um, yeah, before I could even get to how can I supplement, I just said, I'm gonna supplement all of this <laughs> and, I hate not, and not do any of it um, yeah. because it's, I knew it was just gonna be a constant challenge. And I understand, you know, this has been in existence for a long time. And yeah. so many of us are conditioned to what school looks like and what learning looks like and what education looks like. They can be three completely different things. Um, so for my family, we decided to explore what learning looks like on our terms and slowly start to remove our own conditioning as far as what that looks like and be really present with the system and with our system and ourselves, knowing that we have work to do as individuals. That's awesome. So, and you also said you started to focus on your children and what it is yeah. they wanted to be and how they wanted to learn. Can you tell me how that, how that whole process evolved and you know what, what caught your attention? Like, wait a minute, this is my girls and they want to do it this way. Can you yeah. talk about that experience? Yeah, definitely. Um, for me, it was, um, it started at the playground, you know, like there's the playground for me is the cornerstone of understanding. If you really want to get to know your children and how they connect with other children, watching them play at the playground is a plethora of information. And 
seeing them doing things. For me, going to the playground just felt like a death trap, to be honest, because I was definitely the helicopter parent mom. I didn't want them to get hurt. I was always, oh, you're going to, you're going to. I would always go through that. And there was one moment when my, one of my children, they were climbing a tree and I'm right there and I'm, you know, holding it, like hoping that they don't fall, but I still want them to have this experience. And in that moment, I was right there and she still fell. She still fell. So for me, it was a moment of, you know what, even if I'm right here, what can I really do? Like, where's my control? It became a relative term. So from that moment, I started to let go and I started to ask them more questions of what would you like to do? And really hearing them, not necessarily hearing what I believe they're saying based on my experience, but them saying, I'm interested in something. So my daughter, for, for the longest time, she wanted to be a cheerleader. And for me, that was really disruptive to my mind because I'm thinking of short skirts. I'm thinking of over-sexualized children and who are going to be adults. I'm thinking about all of these things that would make me look at this idea and say my daughter's a cheerleader. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with cheerleading. But for me, it just was, it was something that was hard for me to swallow because she's picking out all these clothes. And I'm like, well, wait, no, <laughs> it doesn't work that way. But after conversation with her, it wasn't that she was thinking about that at all. She just enjoyed tumbling. She wanted to learn. So we invested in figuring out to get her into a tumbling class. And me letting go of what that looked like to say, okay, it's tumbling. It's gymnastics, it's this, or maybe it is cheerleading down the line, but how can I support her in that without me imposing what my conditioning is into what they want to do? All right. So then your focus became around your children and their desires, um, and then you educated around what they wanted to do in life. Yes, yes. For me, I am definitely more of a guide. I want them, I don't want to suggest to them what they should learn. Now, if we're talking about life skills, if we're talking about basic, you know, cleaning up behind yourself and all of those types of things, I can definitely support that. But I think any parent knows that you can tell your child all day, brush your teeth twice a day, do this, clean your room, make your bed. How many times are they really going to do it before you bust in there and say, please clean it or you do it yourself? Um, but for me, I had to let go of that. I had to think about when I was a youth, did I really want my parents rummaging through my room, going through my things? There was no, there was no agency, at least in my opinion, in my experience that I had. There was no agency for me as a child to define what that looks like. If my room is a mess, then I got to own that. At best, as a parent, I closed the door. But it's none of it's mine. It's all their stuff, you know? So who am I to say what order looks like? I'm just telling them my experience with order. But they are not really given an opportunity to define what structure looks like for them. And if I don't do that, then they're really just going to be small versions of me. And I'm not interested in creating other mini versions of myself. I want them to be truly authentic as much as possible and for who they are versus a copycat of me. So how did you come to that point though of letting them truly be them instead of not copying you? Did you recognize like you were pushing yourself onto them or like how, how was that? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it, it happens. It's a, it's a slow process. Um, and it happens here and there. It's one of those, you know, when, if you have your child in there at someone's house where they've been gone for a while and they, they exhibit themselves in a certain way of where did you hear that? Or I've never seen this behavior before. And as a homeschooling parent, I don't really have that to lean on. If I'm seeing a particular behavior that is questionable to me, by and large, it's coming from me. So I had to see how my behaviors, how they interpret my behavior, how they perceive my behavior. And yeah, I have years of knowledge and experience they don't have, but a young person is going to interpret what you do in their own way. So for me, it was about taking those times out. And instead of me yelling or 
reprimanding them in a really harsh way about what their behavior is, I take stock in myself and say, well, wait a minute, let me get to the root of this. Because if I'm just yelling, I'm just addressing, I'm just, it's a band-aid. I just don't want them to do what I do, right? They're interpreting that. So if they're getting it from me, how else can I be, how else can I assist them in their growth if I'm not willing to change some of my behaviors? So for me, it was a very slow process. Something as small as, mom, can I have some candy? No, candy's no good for you. But I know at night when they go to bed, I'm getting down on my candy and my chips, right? So they don't know. <laughs> so I'm doing that. And one day I got caught, you know? So I go to the store, go to the bodega, get this, get my little treat for myself as my celebration deal. And they see it. And they question it. Well, mom, how come you can have this candy or these potato chips, but I can't? And in, in as small as it was, it really made me think about, well, why? Truly, why? If I'm worried right. about their health, their right. cavities, all the, all the explanations that a parent will give to their children right. about why right. they don't want them to have candy. And meanwhile, I'm doing the same thing to myself. So am I saying that my health isn't as valid, isn't as important? Because it is. And if, what, if, what happens if you do have that one piece of chocolate or that bag of chips? Will it really ruin you? What, what's wrong with experiencing? So for me, it was really about taking stock in my behavior and seeing how it's interpreted and then allowing myself to also change at the same time. how deep their conditioning is until it's face to face right in front of them and you have to be vulnerable you have to be able to shed back those layers of conditioning of generation of transgenerational trauma uh, trauma excuse me and really be willing to dig really be willing to examine what it is about you presently that is you right now going back and saying what was what was my childhood like? How was that connected? Um, how is the effects of my childhood connected in any way to how I'm treating my children? And many of us, if we're coming from homes where we've had not so great situations, many of us say, I don't want to be like my mother. I don't want to be like my father or whomever you were raised by. And you work so hard to do that, that you wind up becoming that one person you didn't want to be. Uh, because you're working so hard against it, but you're not really allowing yourself time to and enjoy and empowerment to really become yourself and really define that. Telling my parents or my family that my children are not going to school um, and being a stay-at-home mother and doing all these things that aren't okay, but it all came down to me willing to break my own cycle my own patterns because once I was able to do that then things opened up in a way that I was able to connect with my children that I couldn't before yeah and that's and that's to me that's the whole thing and breaking these cycles um breaking these patterns because I tell people you're stressed out with these public schools you're stressed mm -hmm. out on these time tables um that mm -hmm. society is saying we have to do this nine to five we have to be at this school and um, there's no real partnerships. So it makes it a stressful um, venture. So to me, homeschooling is just the better option. Um, and then I understand what you're saying with K through 12, but I know parents who can't really afford to yeah. pay for curriculums. Mm -hmm. So um, would you say um, you're developing a homeschooling networking so parents can learn about um, different options in um, homeschooling and see what is affordable and what's not, <laughs> excuse me. Yeah, of course. Um, well, for my business, Eclectic Learning Network, it really is eclectic and I am not anti-school. I am not any, I'm not against any method that works for your family because there's no way that everyone can do the exact same thing, no different than why I'm not interested in putting my children in school. But if that type of structure 
works. My issue is how can the system has to be addressed? It's not just about how pretty you make the walls or how many people are in front of the classroom. It's an, exactly. a full indoctrination, whether it's the leaders of the school, teachers of the school, the faculty, and students. It's a full indoctrination. So none of that is going to matter if they're following the same system. But my business and what I look to support um, very, very strongly Black and Brown families who are in Philadelphia who want to be able to explore how can I support my children even in these circumstances. So if you are looking at a virtual school, just I can support that in knowing, know your rights, know what, know what the policies are, know how you can bend and fold, now, know how you can continue to provide enrichment to your children outside of your business. Because maybe you do send your children to school and that's perfectly fine. I am not a homeschooling parent who's saying you're horrible for sending your kids to school. No, I get it. There are certain circumstances that you cannot just easily fold and get away from. I wholeheartedly get that. Um, but when it comes to, so what can you do on your off time? How are you addressing what after school looks like with you as a parent? How are you creating space in your home on the weekends? What, what, type of, what types of conversations are you having with your children when they are in these spaces to be able to support them? Many times our young people are not coming to us when they have not, uh, when they don't have a great day. And that could really change everything. Maybe they've been bullied. Maybe a teacher said something to them, or maybe they did something, but they don't feel like they're in a space where their voice is valid. In many circumstances, our young, our young people are going to, into these spaces and their voices are not heard at all. So they're used to being talked at, but they are not being talked to. So there is no room for dialogue. There is no room for a child to be able to express, this is what I'm interested in, this is what I like. It is more of, this is what I'm telling you to do because I want you to do it. And the why is because I told you so. That's not going to be enough. It wasn't enough for me as a young person. I'm going to question that wholeheartedly. So I would expect a child now to do the same thing. So there are options. And I focus on working with parents exactly where they are because I'm not here to convert anyone. I wanna be able to supply you with enough empowerment that you can do these things on your own. Whether it's a resource that you can constantly go to, whether it's having a consultation with me, whether it's me connecting you with another family who's going through a similar circumstance, whatever that is, then my business becomes supporting you to get you to feel and believe in yourself as a parent and as an educator, because you don't have to be certified. You're a parent. You do the very best you can. I don't know all the answers, and I will never assume that I do. So, but I do have a plethora of resources, and that's all we can really do and support each other as as parents. Our children have no idea. They're pretty new to life as we know it, but we're the ones who need the most amount of support in doing it. Yeah. So um to that excuse me, to that point, in the African American community, um homeschooling is, is so fair because they're used to brick and mortar. They're used to somebody doing an education. So back to breaking the patterns and the and the cycles, you help them. Is that what you do with your networking? You help them to navigate different systems um, and create support systems or do you have a support system that you offer to help um, break those cycles because um, building a curriculum for some people could be easy and for others could be terrifying. Do you help with those type of resources and all the above? I mean, it, what I do is I cater to everyone's needs as best as I can. So I'm going to either do one of two things. I have certain families who really are looking for a very customized learning guide that they're going to do. I personally do not, the word curriculum for me really could be anything. Like I, my daughter right now is, her focus is culinary arts. So everything that she is engaged in, that is the umbrella. That's the overarching theme of what she's doing as culinary. So she can learn 
her math, her geography, her history, all of those things can be learned under the umbrella of culinary arts, but it's in the way that she wants to do it. But for any other parent, if you're looking for something and you're not sure where to go, you can always contact me and we can have a consultation. I also work with small businesses and organizations in the city and we partner up for programs. once a month and exploring nature and learning about that. Um, I will have opportunities for an artist showcase so young people can create art and sell it and they keep all the money um, to get the support entrepreneurship. Um, same opportunity for them to get together. There's a book club where young people get together and they meet once a month and they discuss a book and they continue. So, and that just kind of scratches the surface because every family is truly different. So, whatever their needs are, I take stock into that and we meet as members and we discuss that. So it's not just everyone sitting there kind of starting with this blank canvas and unaware. It's like, no, I wanna get as many of you as possible into a room so that you can really hear what everyone else is going through because it may be stressful, but then you'll understand after a while that you're not alone in all of this and school in and of itself the idea of black and brown people not being in school is parity for many people if i think about jim crow if i think about segregation all of these things makes the argument for why someone would leave school to be silly like well we, we've done all this work we've done this and we've done that but for me personally i do not believe that the system was put in place for people for brown and black people so I believe the system was definitely set up for us to become something that allows us to lose who we are as a culture. And that I'm not here for. So if I'm going to do anything about introducing of culture, I'm going to do that on my terms and not because of these Eurocentric ideas about what history is or about conduct or language or any of those things that are completely glossed over, if not just removed in general from a brick and mortar experience. So, and creating a homeschooling culture for your family is based around the needs, the wants and desires of your children, and then your culture as a person in which you want your children to know and understand. Yes. Um, so, and getting those type of how do you do it to be where you meet state requirements? Like, how does that part work for you? Um, we will go over them. Um, educational objectives are pretty easy to come up with, but everything can look a certain way on paper, but how you decide to go about it is up to you. So I can work with families coming up with educational objectives, coming up with letters of intent, to submit, you feel me? So mm -hmm. we can come up with whatever we need to come up with that supports benchmarks, that supports what you want to do. But when it comes yeah. time to the execution, yeah. then you do what is necessary that's gonna support your family. Yeah, so this is like freedom. This is really like breaking away from a system and um, creating what you want your family to be I'm um, family focused, family purposed, and the purpose is what the children want to be in life and not what you want them to be in life. Um, I'm really um, excited and happy that you're on the um, on this chat with me um, and sharing this information with my my network of friends. Thank you so much for all y'all listening and supporting. Um, so the event is October 15th. I don't think I talked much about it. Um, I wanted to talk about it. So hosting an event at the Academy of Natural Science on October 15th. Um, it's yes. $45 to get in, everyone. Please support this event. It's well worth the $45, especially if you're interested in homeschooling, because as you see, she has just given us a wealth of information and how she can connect us to really educating our children the way we want to educate them and not the way a system wants to mold them and make them be what the system wants them to be. Because the truth of the matter is that system is old and played out. It's more of a school to prison pipeline now because the whole job industry is no more of those jobs where they could just say, oh, you're going to work here, you're going to work there. 
they're no longer really providing those opportunities. Um, but do you provide like different apprenticeships and do you have a summer camp or is there a summer camp that's going to be showcased at the Academy of Natural Science on October 15th? So for the, what's happening at the museum, the Academy of Natural Sciences, I'm having my second annual homeschool conference and Explorers Day Camp. So this is an event for young people as young as four and up to be able to come in and enjoy. Um, it's $40 per person and it'll include lunch, um, admission to the museum, as well as any additional activities that are gonna be there. The theme this year is creating racial equity in home education, because I'm not gonna sit here and pretend um, when we think about the history of US-based homeschooling, it is a predominantly white and highly religious group of people. So with African-American families taking the lead on the number, the percentage of people who are transitioning to homeschooling, these existing spaces are now having to deal with not themselves. Um, so my focus is to provide training for families and um, for representatives of spaces who do hold space for alternative learning um, so that they understand that it is essential that you have multiple cultures in your space, what that means. Having people on the board of color, having leadership and facilitators, black and brown leadership there, um, making sure that my big focus for that. So that is something that our, the parents will be doing with me. And then while the workshop with me throughout the day, youth will work with the facilitators of the museum and participate in a full day of activities. Um, youth ages four to 12, they'll be going around to the butterfly exhibit. Everything is hands-on. Uh, last year, they got to um, drop some pieces that they created off of a balcony just to see if it would break, like uh, will they break the, uh, for a paleontologist moving bones, will it break? Um, and then this year, uh, teens will have a full animal husbandry workshop. So if teens are interested in learning how to care for animals, uh, they'll learn how to feed and take care of them and also prepare some for the animal, the live animals that they have at the museum. So it's going to be a really full day um, of pure empowerment and most of all for me, fun. And people should get there at 10 o'clock to enjoy all of these activities, correct? Is there like yeah. a schedule or it, does, it just goes on all day long? Yeah, it's it. I would definitely suggest getting there at ten, because um, once you're once you're there and registered and checked in, young people will go off with facilitators, and then adults will come into the, a separate area, and then we'll start talking. I mean, you can definitely come a little later if that just works best for your schedule, um, but we get started right from the top. Okay, um, well, I think you really covered most everything that. I wanted to talk about, um, and I know you were giving me an hour to talk, and I think you answered all the questions that I see here. Miss um, mm -hmm. Ruth had a question about her niece's, um, she said, my niece is homeschooling her three daughters for the first time starting Tuesday. Are there support networks that she can plug into of parents that are experienced with this? <coughs> And I think like if she could contact you, maybe you could connect her with some of those parent networks um, possibly. Yeah, um, I mean, well, for me, I am a network in and of itself. So um, let's see, I'm looking at, is that for Ruth, I believe is the person yeah. who asked the question. Um, Ruth, definitely mm -hmm. feel free to, you can do a couple of things. You can check out my website. It's at eclecticlearningnetwork.com. And you can also contact me directly if you'd like to send me an email. It's malika at eclecticlearningnetwork.com. And my name is M-A-L-E-K-A. -A. And feel free to send me any questions you may have, or if you want to set up a consultation, we can do that. But there's a lot of information on the website as well. But I can definitely cater to individual needs. And I so I understand what it means to start from the very beginning and the hesitancy and anxiety of what that looks like. So I'm happy to help any way that I can. Um, and then when we tried to do this last week, um, a young man came on and he said that 
if you don't have any experience or or a degree in teaching, don't even try to homeschool your children, right? And and that's a big fear of some parents who are really sick of the system because they were dogged by the system and want more for their children, um, mm-hmm. but don't have any experience teaching them. Do you have any advice for them? And how are you able to help those type of families also? Yes, uh, my degree is not in teaching. <laughs> um, You do not have to be a certified teacher um, or have any kind of special degree. Um, I was just posting the website for someone. Um, You do not need that. And my my focus is definitely to get rid of that taboo idea. Um, Well before, I mean, for Pennsylvania, kids are considered compulsory at the age of eight. So that's the time when if you wanted to enroll your children in the school that you have eight years to work that out. Well, before your children reach, whether it be preschool, some may, most start at six, your children are able to walk and talk, right? You did that, you did that. So basic shapes and colors and numbers, you did that. Mm-hmm. And whatever support you had along that way, now granted it changes as you go along. There is no easy part of any of this. I will never pretend that any of this is easy. Um, but when you are supported and you can acknowledge the fact, if you just start clean with, I don't know, but I'm going to figure it out. That is always a good way to start. If you go in believing that you have all the answers, you're going to hit a brick wall and that's not going to be helpful. Um, and then know your boundary, know where your limits are. I have my boundary and I will let my children know in a heartbeat when they've exceeded my personal internet when they have just all their questions like you know what you should feel empowered to be able to search those out for yourself but that takes work and time to be able to, to develop that relationship but in the beginning it feels lonely it feels isolating and especially for black and brown families who are journeying into this there's so few of us who are connected at the same time where we're all throughout the city but in order for us to come together that's a different thing um and each one of our families we're not a monolith so we're going to have different things that we're interested in in a different focus and in the moment it just feels like it's just you and your child or you're not sure about the socialization aspect of it none of that matters um when i think about teachers and i know quite a few and when i think about what they're actually prepared to do and handle in a classroom, I don't think the piece of paper matters. Because if the piece of paper mattered, then we wouldn't be having this conversation. If the piece of paper actually stated and given full proof that our children would be leaders of tomorrow and successful and not have to go through this glass ceiling effect of what their life could be, we wouldn't be having this conversation by any stretch of the imagination. They would understand what it means to have black and brown bodies in the school. They would understand what it means to have appropriate resources and money and smaller classrooms and current textbooks. That would all, that wouldn't, that shouldn't require a strategic planning meeting. That's just given information. So for me, as much as I understand that it can be a stigma when people say, oh, well, you need X, Y, and Z. I will wholeheartedly disagree um, because the piece of paper doesn't define anything other than you too embrace being indoctrinated into a system. Yeah. Um, and I come from a family of educators. Um, Ms. Ruth is an educator. She's one of my education advocacy partners. Um, mm-hmm. So I'm happy to see that her grands and her niece are doing the homeschooling thing. Um, because we're just sick of what's going on with the public school system with this brick and mortar stuff. Um, and how they're just gassing our families up with all these schemes, right? So I'm really promoting homeschooling hard for families so they can understand that they can take control of their life and what's going on in their life. And I also pr- promote entrepreneurship um, mm-hmm. because that's another part of freedom. Um, yeah, that's a whole nother story in itself, but I'm really happy to support you um, and the work that you do. I'm going to share this um, live stream widely 
um, and try to get as many families as possible to attend just so they can learn about homeschooling. Will you do a lecture or anything, or is it all going to yeah. be just yeah, the, a lecture? Yes. The, the first half, um, I will be reviewing the history of U.S.-based homeschooling, and I'll also go through different pedagogic methods of the different what homeschooling can look like. Um, but I will always preface that that is a multitude of answers because everybody is going to have a different way to define what homeschooling looks like for them. Um, so I don't want people to feel like, oh, I'm just going to go for this answer. It really is set up for you to take in information and give yourself time to really sort through that and recognize that there is another way to do things other than the way that you've been taught or believed to be the way. So that'll be the first half. We'll have lunch. And then the second half, I'm going to have an organization come through Artwell, and they're going to do some exercises with parents to be able to assist them with setting up those boundaries for themselves. So if you are in spaces where you don't feel like your needs are being met, you'll be you'll feel like you have a better understanding of how to engage when those needs are not being met. Um, I think you're awesome. Can you just tell me why you started the network? Say again? Can you tell me why you started the network? Mm, um, so I started this, I started homeschooling my daughters about, uh, for me, it starts when they arrive to this world. That's when learning starts for me. Um, so that was 13 years ago. And we've been on this journey for 13 years. And when we started getting into the compulsory age, I realized that there were so many parents that I was speaking to who was, they were looking for something other than just other than, um, not really exactly sure what it looks like, but just something other than what was given. And I knew how I felt when I was going through this. And there were plenty of times when I just wanted to fold and give up. And I did not want to, I was just willing like, look, we're just gonna buy these uniforms and we're gonna call it because I can't, but I stuck in there. And I don't really know how I stuck in there, but it, it was worth it and, <laughs> There's no way in the world that I would want to see another parent have to go through anything remotely that I went through and feel like there is no support, that you're just alone in this race trying to figure out what to do. So I started it because of the voices of the community. I started it because my daughters constantly are an inspiration to me. So it is, it's just a labor of love and I will do it as long as it's needed. Um, but I think it's awesome what you do, and it's very much needed because um, our communities don't understand homeschooling. It's a big, like, fear to mm -hmm. homeschool because they don't think because of the education that they attain. And I'm talking about the people that I talk to. I mean, I know there's others of us who do understand homeschooling, but the, mm -hmm. the people that I talk to are frustrated with the schooling system. Um, and can do the homeschooling. Some of them actually can because they have disabilities or whatever their issues may be. So they're able to stay home, but they don't feel like they, they can do it. You know, they just, they're really intimidated by it. So you're, you're like somebody that I would really push them to, um, to talk to, um, and just to come mm -hmm. to this conference, just to get a feel and an understanding that we do it every day. Like a lot of them don't even understand that they're homeschooling every single day i mean because it's all about who you are as a person um yeah. and who you are as a culture but i'm glad you said that you don't push on who you are as a person that makes me thinking maybe i need to look at what i'm doing too because i do listen to them and um i try to do what they want to do you know i always ask them first you know i don't try to push and if they say no i don't do it but I don't know. I think some parents are just intimidated by the fact of actually being responsible for educating your children because they have a different idea of what educating your children is when we actually do it every day. So I'm just really grateful for your um, the work that you do. Um, oh, this is you. the second conference at the Academy of Natural Science. I love the Academy of Natural Science. It's one of my favorite places to go. Um, if you have an access mm -hmm. card, you could go for $2 per person, up to four people. Um, and it's just a great learning experience. I take my grandchildren, it's like the best daycare, like the best preschool center you could get for $2 per family. 
Um, and if the children are under three, I think it's free. Mm -hmm. So, um, but on October 15th, please try to make it to the Academy of Natural Science. It's on 19th in the Parkway. Uh, 1900 Benjamin Franklin Parkway. Yeah, um, it's a great museum. Please donate to the museum also um, because that's what help us keep those doors open. I am, like I said, a big fan of the Academy of Natural Science. Um, mm -hmm. And Malika, would you like to share anything? Because my whole thing is getting people to understand that they can homeschool. You don't need a degree. You can break these cycles. Um, I'm trying to break the stigmas associated with educating your children. Um, mm -hmm. And the fact that you offer so many supports is like a major plus. So I have somewhere to point parents to, families to. But the shoestring budget, is that possible to do homeschooling on a shoestring budget? It really is going to define, it's going to be measured by how you define homeschooling. If you are a family who is heavily into structure and you need an immense amount of books and textbooks and things like that, then it's costly, hands down. If you are more loose and looking for something that you can kind of ebb and flow with, for me, I'll say with school supplies that I buy for my daughters, um, and I go to Staples, right, for the educator, they'll have a teacher's deal, and I'll get a whole bunch of notebooks for like 50 cents. Um, in addition to a couple of extracurricular activities that they do, I pretty much invest about $300 a year. Three That's good. Now, That's awesome. Like when I'm looking at supplies and things of that nature, that's about what I spend. Now, I have one daughter who does drumming. She'll do that. Um, those classes are $15 a class and she goes once a week. Now, they can only have one or two options at a time because money is real. So it really just depends on how you define homeschooling. And for parents out there, um, especially the parents that you're connecting with. In addition to the conference, the one thing that I do all the time is if there are a group of parents who are interested in learning more, and it's maybe like five or six parents, I can just create a small gathering just for them, and they can ask whatever questions they want. Um, and we can just sit together and figure out what that shedding looks like. Because to homeschool, that's the easy part. The easy part <laughs> is homeschooling. The difficult part is you, your conditioning, your trauma, how you are, how much you're willing to let go and embrace for this idea. We, most of us are raised with this notion that children don't have a voice. So the idea of giving our children space to be able to say what they want to do or not could be completely ludicrous for families that we're coming from. No, a child doesn't say. You speak when spoken to. All of these things. They don't have rights until. So what I'm saying is, let's pull back from that. Let's really look at it. Parents will, like, you don't have, it's not embarrassing for your child to say, no, I'm not interested in that. That's perfectly fine, because my children tell me things all the time that they want to do. And I have zero interest in wanting to do it. So I, how could I expect anything otherwise from them? Yeah. Um, well, I'm excited. I'm excited to um, to know you, to support you, um, to get to know you a little bit more. I do plan to be there. Um, I'm going to email you after this with some more requests. But yeah, that's for us and not for everybody else. Um, but that shoestring budget is like awesome. You said thirty dollars. I mean, come on, like three, 300, 300 for the three, year, 300 for the year. Right. Um, and you're still meeting state requirements, right? Yes. And then you pay like $15 for drumming classes. So that's still homeschool and that's still an extra activity. Right. Right. And it's part of your so, culture. Right. And I mean, culture to me is everything. For me, it's all about being family focused and, and understanding what our family purpose is for me. Oh, most definitely. Um, and and that's what I try to get other families to understand. Like, get off of these materialistic things. Um, get off of yeah. but 
the system says we're supposed to be yeah. doing um, because mm -hmm. it's really stressing our families out from the time yeah. that you have to get up to meet that, that bell to the time mm -hmm. that you have to pick them up, not knowing what your life schedule is. Like nobody lives at nine to five anymore. Um, no. Some people <laughs> are working two jobs just to pay the bills. It's like yeah. very, very stressful. Um, and it's just, for me, it's more about erasing that stigma. So this conversation yeah. helps me help other parents who are stigmatized be able to direct them to you to help them yeah. understand exactly what that process is. Um, talk about like where you, where you started and how you got there and what they're looking yeah. for. Because every family is different. As much as I like for us to be connected, and we are connected as African Americans um, in the communities that we live in, but yes. every experience is different. You know, your child yeah. may want something totally different than what my right. child may want. Um, yeah. So, I just hi, Monica. How are you? Um, Monica is also a homeschooler. She's actually a daycare provider, but she's a homeschooler hi, for mm -hmm. um, parents who want to homeschool but have to work the nine to five, she offers her home as a homeschool facility. Um, nice. And some of us are looking to build like more homeschool facilities so parents can understand that freedom. Um, mm -hmm. So eventually we would be like wanting to become part of your network. Um, do you charge like a, like a membership fee or anything to be part of your network or how does that go? I do, I do. so I, I have two membership fees or two membership options. Um, the first option is the Explorers membership, and that's 200 for the year. And my year is literally 2018 for this case. So January to December. I do not go off of years based on school system years. So we start um, at $200 for the year, and that will allow you to get exclusive access to a member's portal. I have a calendar and resources and all the information that you need right online. So if there's ever something that you're looking to do, you can just go ahead and click, see what that is. I have um, curriculum ideas that are there already packaged and ready to go that are separated by subject. So if that's your thing, you have that opportunity to do that. If it's something that you're looking for, then I look to see if I can find it for you. So that's 200. Um, I currently have a promotional one going on right now. It would normally be $70 a year, but it's actually just $30 um, because most of the year is gone. And that will give you access just to the calendar. So for certain families, you may not be able to come out with me in the middle of the woods at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. But I have a bunch of affiliate members that have programs that function during school time hours that you may be interested in. So going through the computer to try and figure out what events are even possible is a full-time job in and of itself. So many of the, um, many of the partners that I work with, uh, I will post all of their events that are right there so that you can just see it at the push of a button. So you can do that from now until December for $35. And then you're also welcome to join us. We have member potlucks that we do once a month um, and just gathering so that we're, we are always in a state of community, sharing with each other, sharing our issues. Our children are playing with each other. I do not do grade age ratios. So I will have young people as small as three years old up into 15 years old, all sharing space together. Um, because I believe that we can all learn something from each other that should not be based on age or grade or gender. Yeah. yeah. Well, I really thank you so much. Um, I could go on and on and on for um, questions, um, but you did give me an hour and I really appreciate it. Is there any You're last welcome. words you would like to say to um, people watching? Because quite a few of these people do either homeschool or are looking to homeschool. Mm -hmm. Do you have any last words you would like to share with them? I think just just continue shedding, shed those layers um, because it's so much and you're, you're doing a great job. Um, I'll say that because there are certain days where it feels like it doesn't feel like you're doing great at all. And it's just the moment. Certain moments are not great, but that doesn't mean that this this initiative into homeschool failure, but moment to moment, 
know that you're not alone. And if ever you're wondering where community is, you can always give me a call um, or look me up and then we can try and see how we can better support you and what you do. But the biggest thing is that you're not alone and you don't have to carry that burden. You don't have to be that superwoman. It's okay to acknowledge when you're not doing all right. That's right. That's right. Oh, wow. This is awesome. And again, Academy of Natural Science is the second annual homeschooling conference. Am I saying this right? Um, and you're going to learn about yes, Explorers Camp, husbandry, husbandry um, for teenagers. They get to learn all about yeah, animal, animals. animal husbandry for kids. And we're going to get some insight on homeschooling in America and why we as African Americans should explore this option and not be so intimidated. <laughs> by the freedom of being family focused and building that family purpose the way yes. we would like to see it done. So thank you so much, Malika. Oh, you're thank welcome. You. Thank you. Yeah. And please, everybody, try to make it to the event October 15th. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Yes. Bye-bye. All right. Bye. Peace. Peace.